Today's session is uh, a session about Tornello and how to maintain players' privacy and security during uh, online chess tournaments. Um, Tornello, uh, for those of you who are not familiar yet, uh, your quick background. Tornello is a word that comes from two words, or the name comes from two words, it comes from the word tournament and then ELO. And so tournament and ELO, which is the rating system, we combine those two words together uh, to make the word Tornello. And that reflects where Tornello came from. We started as a, a chess tournament pairings program, an online version of, uh, of, a, of a pairings program. Um, we started in 2008. Uh, we ran as an online pairings program for about four years, adding features over the course of about four years to end up with, uh, with a, what was a pairings program um, and an event management platform all in one. So the idea was that uh, players could make registrations directly online into the pairings program you could do the pairings and manage the tournament on the day of the event. And then at the end of the tournament, uh, you would be able to then uh, share the results, uh, calculate ratings for players and manage players' uh, profiles over a long period of time, uh, all without any manual effort at all. Uh, in, for about 10 years, uh, we, we didn't add any features and we just had that, those sort of three stages, the registrations, the pairings, and then the, uh, the results and ratings uh, until COVID came along at the start of uh, 2020. And we decided that uh, in order to provide the same experience for players uh, as they would get in an over tournament, uh, we, we decided to add an online game server to Tornello. And we've ended up as quite a unique, uh, quite a unique platform which is the only platform that is designed uh, especially for arbiters and organizers to manage a chess tournament uh, over, the, over the board, online or hybrid, all with the, same, uh, with the same system. So you don't need to go outside of Tornello at all in order to, um, to run an online tournament, an over the board tournament or a hybrid, hybrid tournament. You could be using the same platform for, for every single aspect of registrations right through to submitting tournaments for ratings. Uh, so that's that's who we are, and uh, and I guess where we've where we've come for, from. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, privacy, and um, that's really for anybody who has um, uh, what we call a curating a community. So <clears throat> Tornello is all about building communities of people and helping you to build a community of chess players who enjoy playing uh, playing games of chess and competing with one another in, in some format, whether that's over the board or, uh, or online. So if you're an organiser, if you're a coach, if you're a, a chess streamer, if you're a club captain, uh, if you're an arbiter of some sort, um, you will be, um, you'll be in the right place today. We're, we're, Tornello is here to help you uh, organize your chess events um, more easily and to help you run better, better chess events. We do assume that you know the basics of Tornello and so you've maybe run some events on Tornello before or you know at least how to run events on Tornello um, because we're, what we're covering won't be the basics of uh, how to actually you know, start your very first chess tournament. So if you haven't seen any of those basics, if you're still new to that, um, feel free to jump on our YouTube channel check out a bunch of our uh, introductory videos. We've got introductory webinars as well, uh, and we've got manuals and all sorts of other things that you will help get you up to speed with, with the basics. Um, this is, um, I guess, particularly important for anyone who's dealing with vulnerable people. Uh, and so vulnerable people typically, uh, you know, tend to be uh, children, especially children under the age of 14. So why do we care about privacy in the first place, all right? Why do we care about privacy for, <clears throat> for the players in our chess tournaments? And uh, for me, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, privacy is a human right. 
and the uh, Charter of Human Rights, the United Nations follows, has, uh, you know, I guess, defines privacy as a, a basic human right. Uh, you know, so we do want to, you know, take it rather seriously. Uh, generally speaking, privacy, uh, you know, covers, uh, you know, the, the ability for an individual to be free from interference or intrusion. You know, you can't have the government just storming into your house unannounced. Uh, the freedom to associate with uh, whoever you whoever you want. So freedom of association and 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 thought and religion and and um, uh, you know making friends, being hanging out with whoever you'd like to hang out with, um, and the freedom to uh, be able to control who can see or use information about you. And when we're talking about uh, chess tournaments and uh, and privacy, whether that's over the board or online tournaments. This is, the, this is the key point here, that players should be able to control who sees or uses the information about those players that, that we are custodians for as tournament organisers. So we don't own their data, that's their data, it's their information. Um, we're borrowing it for a short period of time while we're running a chess tournament, and we need to make sure that we respect uh, the wishes of those players in terms of what happens with uh, with that data, and there's this uh, there's this quote here that I've got, which is privacy is not simply an absence of information about us in the minds of others, rather it's the control we have over information about ourselves. So at the end of a chess tournament, just deleting somebody's name is not really what uh, what what we're on about. Right? Just saying to somebody, well, if you don't want your name to be shared on our tournament file or in our results file or in our rating system or in our ratings list, then uh, fine, you know, don't be, don't be part of it, uh, is, is really, again, not what we're, not what we're looking for, right? Um, so it's not just making sure that nobody, there's no information about us. If there, are, there is data, there is information. We do want that to be, uh, to be used and shared, but each individual should have control over who and when and how that information is uh, is is um, seen and used. So there are some uh, there are some general rules about privacy, um, which uh, which which we like to sort of uh, kind of talk about or think about. Um, now, obviously, uh, these are these are general, and it will be different in every single country. But overall, uh, the right to privacy is the right to keep what we call a domain around us, which includes all of those things that are part of us. So, you know, your home, your property, your thoughts, your feelings, your secrets, and, and critically your identity. And the right to privacy gives each individual the ability to choose which of those parts can be accessed by others and to control how and when that information is going to be, going to be put out there, right? So um, keeping these two things in mind, uh, you know, that we have some, I guess, rules and we, we care about it, um, we can, we can uh, understand that it is an important to topic to, to think about and care about. And, and it's great for me to see that there were, uh, you know, so many people who join in these sessions uh, and register for these sessions and watch the videos afterwards, uh, because it shows that there, are, uh, that there are people thinking about um, these sorts of things out, out there uh, in chess tournaments. And, Typically, uh, you know, chess has been slow to uh, adopt technology, um, and and also, you know, in this in this sense, slow to um, uh, to adopt to the I guess more more modern feelings that that um, you know, governments and individuals have around privacy. So uh, we're just to kind of ex explore a little bit further. We're just going to have a look at a couple of uh, specific rules and regulations. Um, now, the, the laws in every country are different uh, and that every country has their own privacy legislation or regulation um, that governs how these sorts of things happen. Um, in, in general, they're all the same. They're all, they're all aiming at the same, uh, I guess, kind of philosophy, uh, which is around the, you know, the users or the individual's right to control their, control their data. But there are some specific differences in, in each situation. Uh, what Tornello is aiming to do is to provide uh, you know, a platform which meets all of the principles 
really, uh, you know, really, really, um, you know, cleanly and simply. And what that should do is then it should mean that any individual country, whatever their regulations are, because we're following best practice in all situations, those uh, those should be those should be covered in whatever individual jurisdiction you're in. So in Australia, there are some key principles for the for the privacy principles, and this is um, where where Tornello is uh, is headquartered. Um, and so we have uh, obligations to follow these. And Australian privacy principles are some of the the more uh, you know stringent around the world. Um, they are not the the most uh, restrictive, but they certainly have a, a good set of principles that we should we should all be adhering to or aiming to adhere to in in everything that we do. So the, the key principles are that uh, when you're talking about somebody's data, that you should be open and transparent. So you need to tell people what information you're collecting, why you're collecting it, uh, you know what you're going to do with that information. Are you going to share it with anyone? There shouldn't be anything that's kind of hidden and secret. So keep it open uh, and transparent. We, we have to, by law in Australia, give uh, individuals the right to be anonymous or to provide an, a, a pseudonym, that is a name which is not really belonging to them. And so of course in chess tournaments, we have to, I guess, balance the, the needs for the players and their rights to be anonymous with our needs as tournament organizers and arbiters um, that we need to know the, the, the valid genuine identity of the player who's participating in order to be able to uh, you know, provide prizes, to uh, you know, trust that the player is uh, of a certain uh, you know, rating level. So um, even, even to calculate and produce a rating system relies on data being uh, accumulated over time. And so we, we have a, a, you know, a kind of a conflicting obligation there. So as a tournament organizer, we don't want anyone in our tournament who's anonymous. We don't want anyone in our tournament who is using a fake name. Um, so we, we need to require uh, that information in that context, um, but then give the individuals the ability to retain anonymity outside of that context where it's required. So in the tournament, we have to know who you are. The other players in the tournament have to know who you are. Right? You can't be anonymous in a chess tournament to the other people, that's, uh, that's not really uh, appropriate. Um, but as soon as the tournament is finished or to people who are not inside that tournament, so people who are not the arbiters, we have to provide anonymity. Um, we should only be collecting the information we really need. So if you're running a chess tournament and you're asking somebody, what's your, what sort of car do you drive? Um, do you really need that information? And if you do, why? And have you been open and transparent about why you're collecting that information? So in general, just collect the information that you absolutely need. Uh, so as an example, uh, for example, you know, with, with players in Tornello, we're asking them for their year of birth, but not their full date of birth, right? We don't really need to send them a message on their birthday to say happy birthday, but we do absolutely need their year of birth. So we know what age category to put them in in a tournament. Right? We know, are they in the top players under 10 or the top players under 12 in a rankings list? So just um, you know, wherever possible, try to reduce the information that you're, that you're asking for and stick to what's needed. Um, unsolicited personal information, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be um, uh, collecting, collecting information that the people haven't uh, given to us. So we can't just go and go and uh, scrape stuff uh, about the person and store that information. Uh, obviously, we have to know that the person's aware. We have to disclose uh, whatever we have, uh, whatever information we, we hold about the, the person. Um, we have to um, restrict our direct marketing only to people who've given us permission. Um, we, we have some restrictions in Australia about disclosing information uh, outside of our, the country borders. Um, we have to make sure that the information that we're um, storing is accurate, up to date, and complete. Right, and so uh, you know we we shouldn't be having uh, you know uh, old information uh, being displayed on the system. You know, so if a player uh, changes their name, they should be able to update their name uh, on 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 the on the system uh, in historical tournaments as well. 
Uh, so if they've changed their name because, you know, for whatever reason they've, they've got married, they've got a name change, uh, we should, we should well, we have a, an obligation to be able to update that information so it's always, uh, it's always um, accurate. Um, so, you know, that kind of applies to the correction of, uh, of, uh, of inaccurate information as well. So, you know, if you've got a tournament with a wrong result, um, you know, player says, hang on a second, you've got a wrong result, you do have an obligation to uh, update that result and make sure that it's accurate, uh, you know, no matter when, no matter when that happens in the future. Uh, they could complain, hang on a second, 10 years later, you know, I won that game against, uh, you know, Vic Doggers uh, back in, you know, back in 2011, uh, why have you got my results wrong in your, in your tournament results files? And you should, you should obviously verify that that's correct, but then uh, if, if you're displaying something inaccurate, you've got the uh, obligation to, to update that. Um, all right, so that's Australia. Um, the other big one, uh, or one of, the, one of the two big ones in the world is the United States COPPA Act, Children's Online Protection uh, Act. Um, and so COPPA is specifically uh, in the United States of America, and it is specifically uh, relating to children uh, that is under the age of uh, 14. But um, the principles that, that apply are probably good principles to, to think about in all contexts. Right? And so that's what we're trying to do with Tornello and what we're trying to educate uh, you know, our users towards is, is not necessarily just to do the minimum that is required by your, uh, your national laws, but actually to follow best practice because laws will change and you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you can't then uh, meet the rules and regulations as, as they're changing. Um, so you know, work towards best practice, even if that's more and above and beyond what you absolutely, at a minimum, need to do in your, in your local area. So um, the, the Copper Act uh, really um, goes, a, goes a bit further. Uh, when it's talking about children's information uh, and you have to um, be able to give uh, parents the information about the, the data that you're storing and you have to be able to get some uh, consent from the parents to use and to uh, maintain that, that information. So uh, what most of, the, most of the principles are, are the same as what we've talked about in the Australian privacy principles, for example. Um, but what the Copper Act does is it extends that to also uh, ensuring that, that uh, you can't just collect um, private information about a child without the parent being able to access that as well. So um, you, know, you need essentially kind of a, a login system where you can have uh, multiple people accessing the same information. Right? So uh, on Tornella, you can have a child with their own account and their own information, but then also the parent can be uh, a, a, an account holder on, on that account and they can sign in as well and, and access and update all of that information if they need to. Um, so uh, that private information includes um, screen names. So screen names are you know, uh, uh, you know, usernames or handles, they're not necessarily real names. Uh, email addresses, video chat, photographs, audio files or, or IP address or geolocation information. So uh, we, have to, we have to really um, make sure that all of that information, if it's being collected, um, parents have access to as well. Uh, the, the one that most people talk about around the world is the GDPR. GDPR is a European law, uh, and they have got some, uh, probably some of the most uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, strictest penalties that, that apply. So um, you can be fined up to 20 million euros for uh, breaches of the uh, GDPR Act, um, or if you're a big company and 20 million is not enough, uh, they can fine you up to 4% of your annual revenue. So um, you know, for most chess organizations, 20 million, it will be enough to scare us off uh, and make sure that we are compliant with what's going on. Uh, but if 20 million is uh, not enough, well, um, then then look out, it could just be 4% of your entire revenue. So um, the, the principles in GDPR are transparency, uh, that is 
sharing the information, but but or why you're doing it with the with the users. Purpose limitation, so you're collecting the data for a particular reason, not just because like, oh, huh, it'd be cool to know what car they drive. Maybe I'll use that one day. Um, it's about minimizing the amount of data that you want to collect, again, only for the, the purposes that you need. It's about keeping it uh, up to date and accurate. Um, it's There are some limitations on, on where certain data is stored. Um, and it's the, it's the, I guess that integrity and confidentiality is the, is the responsibility uh, to you as a data collector um, to make sure that, that the information is protected. And it's not really uh, an excuse to say, well, I collected all this data into my chess tournament, I published the results on the website somewhere, and after that, it's not my problem, right? You, you are responsible for, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the data that you've collected. Um, there's also not really a good enough excuse if you have the entire rating system database on your laptop, and that contains dates of birth and you know, bank account details, for example, or passwords in, in an unencrypted manner, and then you leave your laptop on the train, uh, you are still responsible for, uh, for, that, for the confidentiality of that data. So you should have taken steps to, to protect it. Uh, so you're, you're accountable at the end of the day. So, I mean, all of those things together, we, we can see that you've got to be able to correct the information, you need consent, you've got to give the user the ability to access the data, to delete it, to opt out, uh, and, and even to be forgotten overall. So these are, these are some of the principles um, that, that, we, that we follow. Um, so I guess the next thing to try and understand is what is private information? Right? We know what we need to do with it all once we've got it, but what is it in the first place? You know, is the type of car that somebody drives uh, a private information? So private information in the GDPR definitions, uh, or calls it personal data, um, it's, it's any information which is uh, related to or identifiable uh, or identified uh, or identifiable natural person. So can it identify you or um, is it some sort of identifying data about you? In chess competitions, uh, it is obviously the player's name, the date of birth, uh, it's how you can identify somebody. It could be the school that a child attends or the club that somebody goes to. It can be a, an ID number, uh, you know, FIDE ID number, National Federation ID number, uh, whatever that might be. So uh, obviously email address, um, anything that can identify somebody. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite broad. Um, all right, so we know what private information is, you know, name, email address, uh, you know, phone number, date of birth, uh, you know, and any other, any other things. Uh, we know that we've got some obligations to look after that information. Um, so right, how are we going to go about doing that? There are two different interacting uh, privacy features on Tornello. Um, the first is the privacy for a tournament, okay, for an event. And so a tournament has three different levels of privacy uh, and, and then it interacts with the individual players who also have three different levels of privacy that they can choose, okay? So uh, those three different levels are public, community, or private, okay? Those are the, those are the three different levels of, of privacy that you can have, both as an individual or as a tournament organiser. And there are different situations that tournament organizers or arbiters might want to uh, keep some information uh, confidential. And then there are situations when the individual wants to um, you know, express their, uh, their rights as well. So uh, those three levels of privacy for a tournament relate to the ability to find that tournament, right? So if you're a public tournament, your tournament can be found by anybody in the world, including Google search spiders and robots, okay? So your tournament will be uh, saved on Google servers and people will be able to access it and all the information there will be, uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, crawled by the Google spiders and, uh, and archived, you know, or, you know, 
uh, saved some in some way. So that's that's a completely public tournament. Anybody can find it. Anybody can search for it. Uh, it's it's visible everywhere that you go and look. Um, if you want, uh, you know, one level uh, of privacy greater than just being open to everyone, um, the, the first step would be to prevent Google from finding your tournament. And so we have this community, this privacy setting called community, and a community setting uh, hides your tournament data from the search robots. Okay, so. What that does is it means that Google can't find your tournament, people can't type into Google and find something relating to your, your specific event. It doesn't stop you having your organization, you know, public on Tornello and letting people find your organization, but it does mean that your tournament itself uh, is not uh, indexed by any search engine. And it means that somebody who's browsing Tornello and searching for tournaments and just Maybe typing names or just clicking on things. Um, they, if they're a, if they're a public user, they won't be able to see your tournament. Okay, so for a community tournament to be found, it can only be found by somebody who is logged in to Tornello. Okay, and that's why we call it a community event because you have to be signed into Tornello. Now it's not a big ask in terms of privacy, right? Because it is free for anybody to set up an account on Tornello. And once you've set up an account, you can, you can access, you can search for or find those tournaments. Okay. So um, it's not a, a, a big step, but it does prevent any, um, both, both Google robots and uh, you know, malicious uh, you know, browsers of, of, the, of the web from finding your information or finding your tournament because uh, you know you have to be, uh, you have to take that that step. You have to go through that hurdle of actually creating an account. So a community event is only visible uh, in search for people who are signed in to Tornello. Okay. You can take the URL that is the link to your chess tournament, and you can share that on your website, or you can send an email with that link and people will be able to follow it and they'll be able to see your tournament, right? So what it does is it stops people from searching and finding your tournament. It doesn't stop people from navigating and actually going right there, okay? So if you give them the address, they can go to that address. It's just they can't look you up in a directory somewhere to find out what the address of that tournament is or the fact that there is a tournament happening at all. So a community event, uh, to, to give you an example of the difference between community and public events, uh, we have a chess tournament once a month called an RJ Shield. Uh, we want more entries for that RJ Shield tournament. It's a public event. Anybody can play in it, and we want as many people as possible to come and play and pay an entry fee for that tournament. So we want, if somebody's searching for chess tournaments on, online, we want it to show up in Google because people might want to then come and play in that event. We want people who've never played uh, in a chess tournament uh, before to find that when they're browsing Tornello and go, oh, look, here is a tournament that I can play in. Right? It's open to everybody. Um, an inter-school competition, we run a lot of inter-school competitions in Australia. An inter-school competition would be a community tournament. Right? We don't want anybody in the world to be able to see those inter-school competitions and just jump in and play in them. All right? They're not for everybody. They're for a, uh, a limited set of people, and that is schools in a particular region. Um, and so what we will do is we will share a link directly to that tournament. So the teacher at the school doesn't necessarily have to have an account on Tornello, right? They, they may not. Um, so we don't want them to have to go to the site and try and find our tournaments. We're going to just send them a direct link. Right? They can then register for the tournaments. Their teams can play. Uh, they can share the link with their uh, parents and and uh, and you know grandparents or whoever wants to watch the kids playing their games. Everyone can come along and watch the games. Um, but you know, as a, as a starting point, you can't just find it uh, on on Tornello. It's a what we call a community event. Now, the most uh, serious uh, tournament setting uh, for privacy is the private tournament. What a private tournament does 
is it um, it um, scrambles or puts a password in the URL. Okay, so let me show you uh, how you would do that, and then what the tournament looks like. So this is a this is a tournament. You can see the tournament URL here. This is the the, the link that you would give people. Okay. If we turn that to a private tournament and save it, you'll see that this is no longer a guessable URL. Right? This is no longer something which you could just guess. Oh, I think there's an RJ Shield. Let me just type in RJ Shield and see if it comes up. Right? So this is this is effectively a password within the URL. So a private tournament is not searchable anywhere on Tornello. Even if you're signed in, if you're searching for a tournament, it won't show up. If a if a user is signed into Tornello, they're on your organization, they've played in tournaments before in your organization, and they're browsing through tournaments that are there, even if they're signed in, it won't show up. All right? So this is an unguessable URL. That gives you the clue that it's, uh, it's, it's a private tournament, and it's not searchable by Google. It's not searchable by a user signed into Tornello. Okay? That's what we call a private tournament. If you want somebody to enter your private tournament, you have to take that link. So you copy the link and you send it to as many people as you like. Right? You can post it on Facebook if you want to. It doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't stop anybody from accessing it, but they need to know the specific address in order to, um, in order to reach that tournament. So that's, uh, that's the, the private tournament setting. Okay. We have uh, one more setting, which we call exposed, uh, which I will talk to you about in just a moment. All right, so let's take this off the page for a minute. All right. So um, the next step in privacy that we take is not just with the tournament itself and being able to access and find that tournament and see the information there, but it's relating to the individual user. All right. And so for an individual user, we have to, by you know, all of the, the, the privacy principles that we saw before, we have to give that person the ability to control who and when their data is shared with other people. Right? And we do that, again, by giving the player three levels of privacy over their own information. Okay, so their own information is their player profile. Okay, let's put a player profile up on the screen so we can understand what is a player profile. Now, a player profile is a name, the name of the person. It might be linked to a FIDE ID, might be then therefore a FIDE rating, a Tornello rating, a history of tournaments. Uh, this is this is the player's profile and their and their history over time. And this is one thing that chess uh, rating systems and tournaments at the moment don't do very well around the world. Um, the, the way that everybody gets around it is they say to people, hey, look, if you want to be in our tournament, you have to waive your right to privacy. Um, and well, I mean, technically you, you can't waive a human right. You can't just say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you, you don't have to uh, fulfill one of the basic human rights which is the right to privacy. So, uh, you know, we're mostly doing it wrong in chess uh, by not giving people uh, enough uh, control over their own information. Um, now, only a very small percentage of people, uh, you know, kind of uh, really feel strongly or care about this, uh, this, this uh, aspect of privacy. Um, but it is, I guess, our obligation as community leaders and, and tournament organizers are, are but as our leaders in the community to, um, to respect those individuals um, because um, there are sometimes situations where an individual does have a, a genuine valid reason for, uh, for keeping their, their data private. Um, and for us to um, exclude them from a tournament because they are, are not able or willing to have that information publicly shared, you know, if they say, oh, well, you know, I don't want my name up on chess results for the rest of forever. Right, um, and as soon as a as soon as a name gets up onto a website or it goes in a ratings list, and the ratings lists are, are published. Um, that information is on the web forever. 
And that's, that's the difference between now and you know, 20 years ago um, when you know, nobody really considered privacy uh, or needed to because, well, you play in a chess tournament, you know, what, what are they going to do? They're going to print your name out and put it on the pairings and stick it up on the wall. And maybe those pairings are going to be sitting on the wall for 10 years because the club doesn't take them off the wall. But it's a very limited number of people who can, who can actually discover that information. And they certainly can't search for it. Right? Now, everything is indexed and archived and saved forever and ever. And so anything that touches, anything that hits the, the internet is, um, is all of a sudden um, very, very public and, and really accessible to, uh, to anybody who wants to, uh, who wants to find it. So it's, it's, very, it's very different, the world that we live in now. So um, yeah, I think chess tournaments and, and rating systems uh, aren't doing this as well as, as, well as we could uh, yet, um, but I know that there are um, more and more uh, federations and organizers and ratings officers who are starting to think about this information. Um, I mean, I can still find on public websites entire rating systems for countries or ratings lists that include uh, every player's full date of birth. You know, significantly private information that somebody with uh, you know a malicious intent could use to uh, steal the identity of 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 those of those individuals, and they've got that at scale. Like every single person in the chess you know rating system published uh, you know with with you know, publicly downloadable data file um, with uh, with all of that information. So that's obviously uh, you know not not great, but we're we're seeing a lot of countries where um, you know they're now they're now hiding some of that information and only showing, for example, the year of birth. So that um, that makes it uh, a little bit a little bit safer. Um, the next step will be obviously to be able to allow the individual users. Who don't want their information to be shared to control who and when that information is shared with, um, without compromising the needs of the tournament organizer. Right? The tournament organizer, we need to know the year of birth, we need to know the name of the player, we need to know all their information. It's private, but we need to know it. And in that context, we should be able to access it. But then uh, we we need the permission of the player. All right. So for the individual player, there are three tournaments settings. So we'll go into this person's profile, and we've got these three different settings. So public, again, is the same as public in the tournament sense. It means that it's open to everybody. You, Google, you search on Google for the player's name, and you'll be able to find the player's name on Google. Okay, So if I just search on Google, I'll get a FIDO rating and a Tornello uh, profile. Right, So you can search for any name, and it can be found uh, on, on Google. The, um, the second setting we call community is again, similar to the community settings of tournaments. So a community setting for a player will hide the player's name from Google, from all the search results, right? So they won't be able to be found by, uh, by, any, by any search results. And anyone who's looking for their name on Tornello, so you go to Tornello and you search and you type a person's name in because you know that they're a player, will only show you their name if you are part of the community. That means if you're signed in to Tornello, then we'll share that information, right? And that's a very, uh, you know, common, that would be a recommended setting uh, for players. If your players are ever asking you that question, what, where do you think it should be? I think community is, a, is appropriate um, because you're, you're, you're sharing your information uh, not so widely and only with people who it's, uh, you know, relevant and interesting for. So that's um, that should be the, the level that you go to. So if you're a tournament arbiter, you've got some community players, some community players privacy settings in your uh, in your tournament. You can still search for those players and enter them into the tournament. Right. So community can be searched for by somebody who's signed into Tornello. Private is secret. Is like seriously secret. Okay. So a private player cannot be found by anybody. So it's not just uh, Google that can't see the player name. It's not just uh, you know, public users who come to Tornello and search for a person's name that can't see them. Nobody, not even a tournament arbiter, can search for 
that player's name. So a private name cannot be found by anyone at all. The only way for a private player to enter into a tournament, the only way for a private player to, to get their name into a tournament is for them to register themselves, self-registration. Okay. Uh, unless you know, for example, an, an ID. So if you knew a FIDE ID uh, or uh, in a National Federation ID, you could import players with CSV. And when you import the players, uh, you, know, you already know some, FIDE, some identification, you already know some, uh, some ID numbers. And so you'll be able to uh, then access that player's their name at least. All right, so um, once somebody's registered for your tournament, you can see all of their information. So what we see over here on the left-hand side is from a public person, public viewpoint, uh, how a tournament might look from a from a public viewpoint. All right, so let me show you that um, uh, in real life. Let's just open up a guest browser. A guest browser is somebody who's not signed in. And if you're not signed in and you visit a tournament page with some private players and you look at the player list, this is what you'll see. A number of people with their names hidden. Right? So those players with their names hidden are what we would call um, you know, they've, they've, they've enacted some level of privacy. Now, we don't know whether that's community or full privacy yet, okay, because we are here as a public user, and a public user, someone who's not signed in, is no different from a Google search engine, a robot, right? So I'm here. I can see these players in the tournament. Um, I can see all the information about the tournament, so it doesn't impact me in terms of, okay, I can see the pairings. I can go in and actually even see uh, individual games, but I can even download PGN files. I'm just never going to see that person's name. Um, so you know, it remains, it remains, uh, it remains hidden unless I sign into the tournament. So if I sign in now, I'll sign in. Uh, And now I can see a few more names, right? Because as a, as a signed in member of the community, I can now see all of the names in this tournament that are public, uh, that are community privacy names. So DC, DM, HS, I'm signed into Tornello. These names are fully private names, but the other ones we saw before, uh, you know, the uh, o, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, for example, Anakin Skywalker. Um, those players had a Max Windu as well. Even this, I am here, had had their names crossed out before. Uh, you couldn't see who they are. As soon as you sign into Tornello, we can now see those people's names. So this is uh, the first level of protection for those players who re required that level of protection. Their name's not going to be on Google. You can't search for it on Google and find them uh, as having played in this in this chess tournament, right? So the user is controlling who gets to see their information. They're saying, "Yep, I'm cool with my name being uh, being displayed to other chess people in the chess community because they're interested to know what my rating is and who I am and what the moves of my games were, and they can download my games." Uh, so that's that's um, that's cool. Now. I can only see these last three names, D, C, D, M, and H, S, if I actually register for this tournament. So if I enter the tournament, I'm going to enter the tournament. Let's go through the process. Okay. Now, as a player in the tournament, it's not appropriate for me to be private or for somebody else to have their name hidden from me because I'm playing in the same tournament as you. I'm gonna be playing a game of chess against one of these people. So now you can see the names are all publicly available, okay? Well, not publicly, they're available to me 
because I am signed in as a player in this tournament. I've got my little green dot. I'm signed into this tournament. Okay. So that's your three levels of privacy for the individual player. It's public where anybody can see the names anytime. It's community level, which means that uh, only signed in users in Tornello can see the person's name. And then there's the fully private names where only the arbiters or the other players in the tournament can see their information. Right? Only the arbiters or the players can see the information, nobody else. And there's no way to get a private player into your tournament other than having somebody who registers them uh, registers themselves directly. By registering themselves directly, they give, um, they give you permission to access their private information. As a tournament organizer, you'll see in your tournament that you will be able to uh, edit some of that information uh, that the players give you, but you'll only be able to edit the information that they have provided to you, okay? We'll, we'll give, give you some a uh, bit more of insight into that in a second. Okay, I wanna come back now to the, let's just move this away, um, to the tournament settings that we talked about, that we skipped over, which is a tournament settings of exposed. So an exposed tournament is a tournament where um, you're going to deliberately ignore the privacy settings of the players. So for example, you might be running a World Youth Championships and there are some players who um, in general don't want their names to be displayed publicly, right? And they've got their right to do that. But it's the World Championships and the World Championships is of public interest. And as an organization, you make a decision that um, there's terms and conditions for playing in this World Championships. And that is uh, everybody in your tournament has to have their name publicly visible. And so you can now force that while the tournament's in progress, we make this an exposed tournament. Right? And an exposed tournament, we come back to that same tournament as we uh, but now signed out. Let's come back here. So we're coming back to that same privacy tournament, but signed out. And even though I'm signed out, I can see that all of these names are now visible because I've changed the tournament from a private or a community tournament to an exposed tournament. Okay. And exposed tournaments will reveal all of the private information about the players in your tournament, but only while the tournament's in progress. Okay, so once the tournament is finished, you don't have to remember, ah, oh, that's right, Anakin Skywalker doesn't want his name to be shown, or, uh, you know, I've got to remember to, to take Obi-Wan Kenobi and make him private again. As soon as the tournament's finished and people are looking at finished results, there'll be that uh, privacy reinstated. So this exposed tournament, um, you, you must inform the players who are in your tournament that their names are going to be uh, uh, are going to be publicly available during the event. Um, but we do have uh, a type of security that we call temporal security. That is, this information is only available for the duration of the tournament, so for a short period of time, right? And that, that um, means that it is, um, you know, reasonably secure. Right? It's not there forever. Once the tournament's finished, it will automatically revert back to... Um, the privacy level that each individual player has chosen. And if the players choose to have different privacy levels a year and two years and three years down the track, that's fine. All of the data of all of the tournaments in the past will update immediately. So you, you don't have to worry that somebody played in a tournament 10 years ago and they say, oh no, now I want to be private. Something's changed. I need, I need my results to be hidden. You don't have to delete their rating. You can still keep their history. You can still keep all of your tournament files intact all they do is they just tick the box themselves to say that they want to be private and now their name is hidden in all of the previous tournaments that they've played in all the ratings everything's everything's gone all right so that uh exposed uh setting just be a little bit careful about it because you are actually giving the um you know you're overriding the information that the players in the tournament have asked for your overriding their request. So 
you know, it shows here, these are all the people who want their name hidden. And you're saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to follow your requests. And I'm going to publish your name publicly on the internet for everybody to see. Right? So you do need to let people know if you're going to do that. But the nice thing is uh, it'll bounce back to normal um, or to, to, to meet the requests of the players after the event's finished. Okay, so um, those, are the, those are the levels of privacy for the individual player uh, that will change the public visibility of their name. Okay, so we've got those two interacting uh, settings. You've got the tournament settings and the individual player settings, and you should be able to maintain any type of uh, tournament you like um, that meets your needs as the organizer for the information you need during the event, for the information the players need when they're playing against opponents, but at the same time, giving the individual users the ability to control their own data and share it only if and when they see that it's, uh, that, that it's appropriate. Um, there is a little bit more information that you may have uh, noticed is available in Tornello. Okay. Um, let me see if I can uh, bring some of that up. Um, and, and that is um, obviously name, gender, and date of birth is private information that is, uh, that is, that is visible when you search for a player. Um, but there's also additional information. If you search in the search box for a name, you may find that you have an email address uh, and or a phone number that shows up when you're, when you're searching for players. So as an arbiter in your tournament, you can click add player, you can type a person's name in, okay? It'll search for the names, even though they've got some slight spelling mistakes, right? And it will then display maybe a contact phone number or an email address. Okay, so we need to understand when will that information be, uh, be visible, okay? Or if you're in a tournament, you click on a player's name, can you then edit the person's name and change their, their name or their year of birth or their gender? You know, all this private information, can you update it? Okay. Um, the rules around that is all about um, permission or consent. So if the player registers for your tournament, if they enter themselves in your tournament, um, they've given you permission to see and edit their information, right? So you'll be able to edit their spelling of their name if they've got it wrong and help the players out. You'll be able to um, view the, um, the email address and the phone number for the player that is, that is registered for your tournament because they've, um, in the process of registering, they have given you permission, they've given you consent, all right? If you just import a list of players from FIDE IDs, uh, you're not gonna see their email address, right? You're not gonna see their phone number, right? Because they haven't given you permission to see that information, right? So it's only when a player gives you permission that that permission will be remembered and you're able to see that uh, information in the future. So email address and phone number, if you type a name into the, into the search settings in Tornello and you see a player with their email address and phone number, it's because that person has given you or your organization permission to access that information. And if a new person comes along, you might say, well, hang on a second, but they're still in my federation. Why don't I get to see, and they've played on Tornello, why don't I get to see their information? Because they haven't given you explicitly permission to view that yet, right? They may have given it to a different organization to play in a FIDE tournament, but now they're coming to play in a Philippines Federation tournament. That doesn't mean that you get the information that they gave to FIDE. They gave permission to FIDE to access their email address and, and, and uh, phone number. They haven't given it to you yet. Once they've given it to you, you'll be able to see it for all time. So the next time that they come to a tournament or if you register them for a tournament, you will still see that information because they've given you permission to access that. Um, when you uh, when you edit people's names, if their name is spelled incorrectly, um, just be aware that we do have lots of external profile settings. So in the tournament ratings settings here, you can say, well, I want everybody to have their name displayed the way it is on the FIDE ratings list or on a federation ratings list. And we've got 
you know, Czech Republic, South Africa, Philippines, Belgium, uh, you know, the Dutch Federation, and, and we can add your federation as well if you would like your, your player names to be displayed in that, in that manner. So um, when you select a rating, for example, we say FIDE ratings, this is going to display all the players in the tournament with their FIDE names. Okay, and this comes from the FIDE rating list. You can't change how the person's name is displayed on the FIDE ratings list. So it doesn't matter what you do to their Tornello profile. This is just their FIDE rating. It's a FIDE rating setting on the tournament. Their names are going to be displayed as they would be in the FIDE rating system. Right, when you add players to the tournament, you can search by, uh, by name or ID, and it will come up with the FIDE rating and the data from the FIDE ratings list uh, in this search. Okay, we're in a staging, so it's quite slow, but um, it's, it's much faster in production. So here's all the Magnus Carlsen search results. We can now select a player, and then that player will enter into, into the system. You'll only see his email address and phone number if that player has given you permission to, uh, to, to see that. So that player has to have given you or your organization specific permission, and then you'll get to see that. Okay? Otherwise, it'll just be blank. Okay? So um, you can set uh, any of those national federations uh, names. Okay? And if you're using, say, um, special characters in your names. Uh, let's just see if we can find uh, a player with a special character in their name. We go through and add a player, searching the Czech Chess Federation. We can now search for okay, uh, and you can see that some of these players have got non-English characters in their name with the accents. And so people can actually have their local spelling. You could even have it in a local language. So you could have these names in Arabic, Russian, Hebrew, uh, Thai, Chinese, whatever, whatever language you want. So um, information that comes from a national federation rating list is from the national federation li list and it can't be changed. Um, but the information on the Tornello profile, you could potentially change. If you are potentially changing it, uh, it does not have to be the same as the name on the player's birth certificate or um, passport. You, you can uh, follow our, our general uh, philosophy of having people's real names, right? but their, their name that they are commonly known as. And so what that means is that if your name was John Francis Meadow, but you'd never been called John in your life, everybody calls you in your workplace, in your day-to-day -day life, Frank, because that's your middle name, then that would be an acceptable variant on the person's uh, official passport name. And so their name on the FIDO ratings list might be John Francis Meadow, but they never use that. It's not really the way that they're known. And so you can use their Tornello name and display their on their player profile Frank Meadow because that's kind of what they're used to. You wouldn't put initials, okay? In general, we don't want to have the initials of the players unless you're in India where an initial is a, 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 you know, used as a name, um, you wouldn't be using initials. Um, if they're standing for something else, put the person's full name. You don't want to put their middle name necessarily. It doesn't have to be you know, the, the, you know, every single part of somebody's name. It's just the name that they're commonly known as. So if you've got five names, um, but you're just generally known as you know, Becky Abram, uh, then just use the two names that you're commonly known as. Right? You don't need to have all five or six um, middle names. All right, so uh, you, you wouldn't be able to use some sort of a, you know, nicknames, um, like a social nickname, like, uh, you know, Biffer or Baffer or Dogger or something like that. Uh, you would want to use something that's a, a, a sort of a professional name. Okay, so um, if you are updating players' names, um, that's, that's how you do it. Well, we've, we've seen all the email addresses when they show up um, and, and when, a, when a player registers for your tournament, they are giving you permission, they're putting their email address and phone number in, and then that's gonna be shared with you uh, later on. So uh, I hope that has given you uh, a good insight into 
um, firstly, why it's important to, um, to, to maintain privacy uh, and security for players and private information. Uh, it's a fundamental human right, I think is a pretty good reason. Um, there are also some rules and regulations, some laws in various countries that, um, that require this sort, of, um, this sort of data management to take place, um, regardless of the, I guess, the, the social and um, you know, philosophical viewpoint where, where this is something where we, we should all be doing uh, to maintain equality for all players, give everybody the, the ability to access and play chess tournaments. Um, you've seen how um, uh, Tornello deals with private tournaments, if they want tournaments to, if arbiters or organizers want tournaments to be hidden, as well as for individual users, the control that we give those individual users over their own information, right? And, and all of those things follow the general principles of the privacy regulations around the world. Um, and in, in many countries and many jurisdictions around the world, um, you know, you, you're actually required by law to give some of these features uh, to, your, to your players in, in chess tournaments. So uh, hopefully Tornello can help you to maintain, uh, you know, good, clean, healthy um, privacy practice. Uh, we can give all of the individuals the rights uh, that, they, that, they are, that they are due. Um, and we can do all of that um, without costing you a lot of time and energy. Uh, and you can just run your tournaments, uh, have your information um, that, that you need easily accessible and know and feel confident that all of those privacy regulations are being met.